Hello everyone and welcome all of you to Nikki Lyle Creative Presents with Industry Leaders where today I'm joined by Pip Jameson. So welcome Pip, thank you so much for joining us and feel free to tweet about the event and post about us on Instagram so we can share it and get the word out there about these events as many people as possible. Welcome Pip. Oh hello, it's great to be here. <laughs> So I know that most people that are here know you already, but would you mind just quickly giving us a quick introduction about yourself? Yeah, so um, yeah, Pip Jameson, um, I founded a platform called The Dots, which I guess we describe as sort of a, a professional network for people who don't wear suits to work. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on lockdown in Kings Cross right now, so I'm really blessed to be living on a houseboat. So yeah, this is uh, calling you from a houseboat and lots of Wi-Fi lines into the houseboat. So I hope nothing crashes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, whenever I've kind of seen interviews you've had, Pip, it's always mentioned your houseboat. And then when I saw you, I was like, oh my God, of course, it's life for the houseboat. This is our first industry leaders uh, from one of those. But, um, yeah. So could you start by um, giving us a bit of a background to your career and, and what the whole process to you then setting up the dots? Yeah, so um, I guess for, for me, you kind of have to go back to the, right at the beginning, I guess. So um, I'm, I'm very dyslexic um, and I guess that kicked off when I was, I think I was around seven and I started falling behind really badly at school. And I think the reason I mentioned I'm dyslexic when I, when I chat to people is sometimes I muddle words so apologies for anyone listening if I don't pronounce a word correctly it's actually because I hear slightly differently um, uh, but fun fact for anyone's listening I don't know who, who's listening at the moment who's dyslexic but 35% of entrepreneurs are dyslexic and 40% of self-made millionaires so congratulations everyone it's a superpower <laughs> Once you get over the reading and writing thing, it's super bad. But I guess the reason I mention it is like, I, I, really, I really struggled in school. And um, when, it, when it came to sort of thinking about a career, to be honest, I was just trying to get through, through school. And um, my, my dad actually worked in the creative industries. So there was a sort of an expectation I'd go into the creative industries. And um, yeah, so my way of being a rebel is I ended up doing maths and economics at uni. <laughs> Um, I was uh, the first of my family to ever get into uni. It was like insane. No one thought when I was younger that I'd get in. Um, and when I left uni, I I really wanted to kind of just make a, a difference and have a positive impact. So and my way of I thought I could do that is joining the government. So I joined uh, the government as an economist. Um, and uh, I um, spent about a year there and I was like, government's not for me. It's just too slow paced and it's too bureaucratic. And so, yeah, then I jumped ship into creative industry. So I was working at the Brit Awards here in London. And then I started working for MTV in various roles around the world. And uh, that kind of led into my thinking about the future of work and why LinkedIn wasn't working and then kind of led to the idea of the dots, I guess. <laughs> Amazing. I'm, I'm actually dyslexic as well. Amazing. It yeah. Is. And I had a struggle when I was younger with school. I remember being put in like special needs classes and it was, it wasn't until I got to university and I was the first person in my family to even do the A-levels let alone go to uni. And they, then they, I was assessed and they said, you're really dyslexic, but you're actually you know, high level of kind of like intelligence and problem solving, but it's, and I thought, so that's what it is. And so, <laughs> yeah. So far, and there's so many people who get left behind. Like, it's so funny, like over, recently, I've been kind of doing a lot of research on it. And the reason we're so creative and entrepreneurial is actually there's this Harvard research that we actually take in more data all the time. So we have wider peripheral vision. So what that means is like humans are the most sophisticated robots that exist and we're just taking in more information and we synthesize that into gut feeling and creative thought. And that's why it's kind of a, it is a superpower. It definitely has its challenges, but like, you know, it does, it does lead to really great thinking, which is kind of a magic. I, I wouldn't take it away if someone said I could magic wand it away tomorrow. I wouldn't take it away, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's one of the things I always liked about you, Pip, as you said, like delightfully dyslexic. And I was like, wow, you're owning it, actually. And that people can be incredibly 
successful a lot. I think Richard Branson's dyslexic as well, I've heard. Yeah, Richard Branson, Joe Malone, um, Holly Tucker, who started Not on the High Street, Anita Broderick, who started um, Body Shop. So yeah, there's just loads of like, actually Steve Jobs was dyslexic, autistic and ADHD, and Einstein was dyslexic and autistic. So oh, it's well wow. to see like the combinations coming together. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And so, um, what inspired you to come up with the dots and where does the name come from yeah so i think it well as well i was working in the creative industries i was just like i was just surrounded by friends that were just working in a very different way than that kind of traditional hierarchical white collar sort of linkedin way i guess so like lots of my mates were their careers were so much more fluid you know the the linkedin way is like you get on the corporate ladder and you work your way up that corporate ladder I guess but I was surrounded by friends who were kind of working I they were adopting freelance careers kind of more slashy based careers so you weren't like a, a specialist and there were also loads of my mates even if we were in full-time work we were also doing side hustles and that kind of more fluidity just wasn't being catered for on LinkedIn it's very like a CV based experience um, and I think on kind of like, a, you know, a, a, another level, all my mates were thinking creatively and I use creativity in its broadest sense of the, the, the kind of thought, but like they were coming up with ideas and building teams around them to execute on those ideas. But weirdly on a much deeper level, my friends were, you know, pay was incredibly important. Obviously we've all got to live, but there was, also that whole i want to have a job that i actually love and i want to work with people i respect and i want to actually have a positive impact on the world and and so i guess purpose as much as paycheck and when i was on linkedin i was like i just felt like it was like you know sell your soul and you know hate your nine to five and just live on the weekends and i just wanted to create a different space which is all about you know, more fluid, flexible, but also careers like finding that wonderful space where you can do what you love every day, which is that magic source in a career, like actually loving what you do. And it is possible. And so I just want everyone to experience that, I guess. Yeah, definitely. And I think with the dots, once you delve into it, everything you've got, like with the projects and how you can add all that, and then you can tag people in with collaboration. And I feel that it's, quite well suited to the name joining the dots because all of a sudden you're just connecting everyone up and that's one of the things that I found is quite powerful about using it actually um and the name yeah this one sorry I forgot your say I'm really bad as a dyslexic I always forget the second part of the question <laughs> but, yeah, you know, the name came about like the name was hell like we did hundreds and thousands of names and then I Funnily enough, I just kept going to meetings and saying exactly what you just said then, like reconnect the dots. And then I was like, oh, the dots. And then, then they kind of like, that was it. And then, you know, we couldn't get the normal URL, so we had to get the hyphen dots. But yeah, it's worked out really well. But that's kind of how the brand name came about. It was more that we just kept saying it. So we're like, why don't we just call ourselves what we say? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And how did you start the dots up? Did you focus more on calling people around and saying, hey, do you want to advertise jobs on the job board? Or did you start with the community first of creatives? Definitely the community first, but kind of the jobs were part and parcel of that as well. So um, when we first started, um, we had around 100 kind of, I guess, what you'd call it influencers now that we, I literally met every one of them and we're like, please, I'm building this thing. Will you be a part of it? And so these wonderful people like agreed to put themselves on there even before we'd launched and and then they were brilliant because they were then spreading the words to their community but then you know a big part of what we do is help connect people to opportunities but you can't kind of go to a company and go like you know will you advertise jobs when you've got no community so so we had about I guess about it's about 50 um, uh, like uh, talent partners that we onboarded for the first year and we, give it, we gave it to them completely free for the first year so that they were using it and our community was getting value from it. But, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't say to them, spend money because we were still growing. And that's kind of, but it's always like two-sided marketplaces like that are always a juggling act. But really what we focus on is um, the community itself and building that community. I find that's really important like myself as a creative recruiter it's kind of like do you get the job first 
that attracts the creatives or the creatives that attracts the companies and it's it is all about community if, if clients and agencies know that you can tap into the best talent then they're gonna come to you regardless anyway mm. um and, and it's magic because it'll be someone will be in a meeting and like someone you know the hr or recruiter person will be going oh where do i find these people and then you know it's our community that will then say well why don't you use the dots so yeah i mean we don't really even have a sales team like it's all sort of driven through word of mouth which has kind of been magic to to grow <laughs> And how did you start off? Was it just yourself or did you start with a team? Yeah, so there was around five of us that started. So I'm sole founder, which is uh, crazy because like female sole tech founders, we're like rarer than hen's teeth. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'm, I was sole founder, but I was really blessed that I had a couple of people. I, this is my actually my second business. I had a previous business in Australia. So I had a couple of bit, um uh, people that work with me in my Australian business that helped me launch over here. So they, I guess they were my founding team. Um, and obviously they're still with me today, but they're all on share options. So like they're very much, you know, part of this journey as well. Um, but yeah, so it was kind of us like just getting in there and just trying to make it work. I mean, like, you know, our ambition is to become the next LinkedIn. It's like the most bonkers kind of <laughs> crazy aspiration ever. So yeah, it's just sort of like just coming together and just trying to make it work, I guess. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, and I've seen that. So the loop was in Australia and that was your first business. What's the Australian market like for creators compared to London or the UK? It's much smaller. Um, I mean, obviously, Australia is a gorgeous gorgeous place to live um it i mean what's amazing for anyone that's thinking of ever working there is that you know they really love european talent because you feel like europe is ahead of the, the curve for them so but it is it's a much i mean just to put it into context there's only like i think it's like 300 400 thousand people that work in the creative industries in um in australia but then here you're looking at well it depends what stats you look at but it's like anywhere from one to three million depending on what industry so it's a much smaller market but what i did like about it and funnily enough i i worked in new zealand for a while and what i loved about even more so in new zealand is because it's quite isolated from places the creative thought is very unique um and i love kiwi creativity because like it's it's it, it just feels very different so i did love that it, it just felt that it was very much influenced by the maori culture and just the culture that was around them and that was kind of nice to be around yeah definitely and i've seen that when i've gone through um portfolios from people from australia and new zealand is they're used to doing everything in the agency whereas in london creators seem to be more like specific on a particular thing like you're either a branding or a packaging or a corporate designer whereas over there they just wear different hats all the time and they just do all sorts of different things creatively and they come over with these portfolios that are brilliant but it's just so diverse yeah. and, and brilliant thing as well is because there's no budget and that may sound like a bad thing but actually sometimes it's a good thing because the creative thought is really unique because you're having to make big campaigns with smaller budgets. So it's kind of interesting to see how they navigate all of that. But yeah, no, I, I, I love, I love, I love the creativity that comes out of it. Yeah. And if you could go back to yourself from when you first set up the dots, would you give yourself any advice or would you do anything differently or? Um, I think, I think when I first started, what was quite, uh, the fear of failure is always quite scary when you're starting something out. I mean, I was lucky that I had the first business first, but I think if reflecting on the first business, like I didn't even tell anyone what I was doing for so long. I was just so scared of just, I had this kind of idea and I was scared that it wouldn't work and I, it was very strange like it was just like what if I put myself out there and it all just completely blows up and I think what I reflected on is that the people I love most in this world are just really proud that I've given this a crack and they're just and you know they're never if, if things go wrong they're never gonna oh she failed they're just really happy that I tried and so I think if I could do it over again it would be like just go and do it and get it out there quicker because and don't worry about that fear so much because yeah literally the people i love most are never gonna never gonna mind that i've given it a crack so yeah it's just 
fear I think I had most. <laughs> That's yeah it's interesting you say that because I set up a company before called Nurture Creatives and my old bosses invested in me to set that up and I remember the initial being like, oh this is so exciting but then lying in bed and thinking oh my god the fear hit me that you just mentioned Pip about I've just gone out there and said I think I can do this what if I fail because it is the unknown you don't know if you're going to make it work but you know in your gut you're going to give everything to make it work mm -hmm. and then I always think that a few years on when you have made it into a bit of a success and there are all these good times you're like oh I wish I could have gone back to myself and say don't worry about it just have faith in yourself and go for it it will be okay. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. And even if it's not, it's okay too. Because, like, yeah. you know, in the end, you learn so much on a journey like this. Like any new project, you learn so much. So, yeah, it's just, yeah. I wish I'd just been a bit, bit more, bit more unscared. <laughs> Is that a word? Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, no, we'll use that though. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> So, um, have you had any personal challenges from being a female in the creative industry that you've had to overcome? Um, yeah, I mean, I think everyone has. Um, I think probably more so in tech um, than because, you know, that's what I'm building. I think tech, tech is yeah, it's just so undiverse it's insane i mean just to put it into context only nine percent of angel funding goes to female founders so that's the, the first kind of investment layer and at the next layer which is kind of series a which we're at it's only 2.3 percent and so that's really tough and i've had really you know raising investment i experienced some crazy things you know like you know investor meetings where you know, investors would just talk to my COO, who's a man and not me and stuff like that. But weirdly, I sort of span it on its head a bit. And I just thought, well, that investor is just not a good person. Like there are lots of great male investors out there. Mm. Um, so I kind of got this indication of who bad people were probably earlier than a male founder would get. But yeah, there's, there's, there's always challenges in terms of of the industry I'm working in you know you know I'm still walking it's crazy I'm still walking into rooms and there just aren't any women in the room and you know the first thing they it's so funny how many people sort of talk down to me about what I'm building and you're just like oh okay I kind of know tech now um and yeah I mean if you start looking at ethnicity and tech and it's just it's terrible it is starting to change but yeah I mean there are inherent challenges unfortunately <laughs> that really surprises me to to hear that you know you with everything you've achieved and, and your name and your reputation and with the dots that you still have to overcome a couple of boundaries when you're going in not boundaries but you know setbacks when you're going into meetings and they're referring to your COO instead of you and I can't believe that's still the case I mean, it's funny, it's sometimes I think they look at me and think I'm just the face and I don't actually get my hands dirty on the tech and I'm like, well, 90% of my job is building the tech. <laughs> so it's just, it's, just, um, it's just bias, you know? It's just a bias. And, and the challenge is, is it's just, there aren't very many senior women in tech. So it's just that bias is just being perpetuated. And I mean, it is changing, but ahead of me, like there's, you know, very few senior female tech leaders. Um, you know, there's more at my level, and now there's an amazing army coming through, which is so exciting. But it's it's just the bias that exists. You know, she's she's not not doesn't really know the tech. She's obviously just the face. And I'm like, oh, it's not actually the face. <laughs> yeah, it's just like educating them properly, hey. And um, I mean, what advice would you give to to any women that may be watching this that are looking to develop a career in tech? Um, I think I mean right now it is a, the probably the best time to do that like I mean things have changed so much since when I started like four years ago and now so when I started four years ago like even getting a meeting with an investor was almost impossible um, now we're finding that investors are actually trying to look for deal flow that is diverse which is really exciting so it's kind of spinning on its head so it's it is the best time than ever 
And I think the other thing is, you know, it's all about building a world-class team. Like, like when it comes to tech, you, it's, you, you are as good as the people you put around you. And that's really hard. You know, it's really hard to build that. And I think, you know, what I've made sure with the journey is that my team are, they all have share options. So they're all, you know, shareholders of the dots. So they share in this journey you know and that we are really collaborative um and so everyone in the business is kind of empowered to have a good idea and 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 off the back of that i've managed to build a brilliant team who just love and really invested in what we're building but that that's the that's the hard to invest all your time at the beginning making sure you're getting the right people on on board is is would be my advice and i think the other thing is letting that includes letting people go if they're not right um, and which is one of the hardest things I have to do every now and again because one bad apple can really rot the barrel, I guess. And, yeah. um, you know, one of our um, uh, values at the dots is positivity. So people focused on solutions, not problems, because it just leads to a really productive, collaborative work environment. So I, you know, if someone's joined and I've made the wrong hiring decision and they're sort of, they start playing politics and all of that, like my job is to get them out of there. Um, but that, but that's, that's a skill I've had to learn because I wasn't so good at that in the early days. Yeah, oh, I couldn't agree with you more there, Pip. It is about building like a really good team that's gonna uh, buy into the vision and where you wanna go and, and be a, a positive rather than a negative. Like of all these industry leaders events I've run where people have spoken about their teams, they just want that, that positive, um influence and like you say someone that doesn't play games of internal politics because it can really ruin a company especially where people spend so much time at their jobs as well away from their loved ones and and working you've got to make it the right environment for people to be inspired and also for people to fail i think the most like you know tech is like the dots is literally about you know thousands of experiments and most of which have failed and so if politics set in and you start getting into that blame you don't build innovation you know the whole point is to come up with brilliant ideas and make sure we can test if they were good or bad but you know as soon as you start getting into politics blame that's where like that creativity stops because people are too scared to make mistakes and actually mistakes are the best thing because that's when you learn how to improve things so yeah it's just really got to be an environment where innovation flourishes i guess yeah 100 percent. and so how many people are in your team at the moment we're 22 so we're tiny oh. <laughs> I, uh, it's so weird because i get all these emails with people like email with they think we're like you know not the size of Facebook, but we're bigger. Um, it's like, you know, it's so funny when I get media emails, so press inquiries and people are like, can I speak to Pip? And I'm like, that email has just come into my inbox. <laughs> um, small team, but I, I love it. I love it. It's kind of like a family and it's super efficient when it's smaller. Sometimes you can be more innovative when it's smaller. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And so how are you all finding working from home at the moment? Because you're usually based in Protein Studios, aren't you? Yeah, so we use usually in Shoreditch. Um, do you know what? It's been, I mean, the team, we've always had really flexible working anyway. So the team often work remote, um, you know, over half of my team are not British. So they'll work remotely when they go see their families and come back. So we were always really set up for remote work. So it's actually, it was a really smooth transition. I think the toughest bit has been, you know, the isolation I guess so we did something at the dots where we put together like a buddy system so every week everyone gets a new buddy on the team and the buddies catch up for like a virtual lunch and coffee and that's been really that's been really good for morale because you don't feel like you're on your own you're still getting that kind of bumping into someone at lunchtime sort of feel um, and that's probably been what's kept morale quite high through through this time is just having each other supporting each other which is the main thing yeah i i do agree because when i now when i call people half of the conversation is how are you doing 
gone are the days of just a quick phone call saying, what's your availability like? It's like, well, how are you? And I've got to know creatives more in the last few months. I've known some of them for years. They've been my go-to freelancers, but I've really got to know the person actually. And um, that's been quite nice because we need that human contact as a human experience of what we're all going through right now. And I think it's the loneliness of being isolated at home. And um, I came live alone. And so that's been really tough. And, you know, we've got, we've got baby dots, so people have got kids as well. But actually what I love about that is the kids have started meeting each other on Zoom. So it's yeah. suddenly you've got these kids who are interacting in the background. So, so yeah, it's just definitely plus and minuses, but it's almost made the team closer. I think it's that whole real deep relationships you build when it's a one-to-one -one chat and not just a group lunch, if you know what I mean, so. Yeah. And so I want to talk a bit more about like the functionality of the dots, because there's loads of really cool things that you could do on there. And I myself just started exploring more like adding projects on there and how you can tie people into those and all the rest of it. Anyone that's watching today, what are the key functions that they should be using and engaging with on the dots that's going to help? Yeah, definitely from a profiling yourself perspective, what you just explain so the way the dots work which is different I guess from LinkedIn is people post projects but then credit the full team around that project and it's really a recognition that creativity is a team sport like the account manager and the producer are as important as the creative team so so that's how you kind of the whole thing works like a bit of a living wiki of projects and the full teams behind it and project could be an app and it would be like this UI designer UX designer front end engineer back end engineer or it could be a full magazine and the full editorial team. But that also makes it really easy to kind of create your profile because you can go on and actually find projects that exist on the dots and give yourself credit for that. Um, so that's from a promotion standpoint, but I think especially in, in the times we're living in now, what's really surprised me is we have an event section where you can obviously discover amazing events and pre coronavirus, that was all like real world events. And we were like, you know, what's gonna happen? And what's been really magical is seeing how many virtual events, brilliant virtual events have kind of come out and loads of upskilling events. You know, lots of our community have been furloughed or sadly some let go as well. And they're using this opportunity to upskill. So that's been really interesting to watch. And what I love about virtual events is they're more accessible because like before this, a lot of the events on the dots are very London specific, but our community is everywhere. And so I've loved how now it's just anyone anywhere can be part of that community. Um, but I think the bit that the one, the kind of beating heart of what we do is we have an ask forum. Um, so this is where you can ask questions. And so questions can be anything from like, how do I effectively work remotely? Or I'm a freelancer, am I eligible for government assistance? And it's kind of career advice section. And that for me has been, I guess, a real blessing to be able to give back because people have really been struggling. You know, there's, there's heartbreaking ask like, you know, I've just been made redundant. How do I get over this? And, and so the community is literally, I've never seen it so beautifully supportive. And so people are doing like, I need CV advice. And you've suddenly got like eight creative directors giving you CV advice. And, and you're one of our mentors, which is amazing because we've now got like, you know, 500 um, mentors signed up who help answer questions as well. And I've just been overwhelmed by how generous the seniors have been if they've got that if they've got the time and they've got the means to be able to give back they're giving back right now and mm. and so uh when coronavirus sort of the lockdown happened we launched a coronavirus support hub and we now also have a black lives matter support hub where our amazing black community are doing shout outs for help and support on it, things that they're creating so the community can support them as well so so yeah i think that's the sort of beating heartbeat bit of the, the dots that's the community side and thank you for being a mentor Nikki by the way you're amazing no, no, thank you so much for asking me it's great I mean, it's been I've seen so much kindness in the industry and, and people such as yourself have given up your time at the moment to talk to me and inspire a couple of other people that have joined us today and people are happy to help right now and that's been just so lovely to see and um, I found someone amazing actually from just your ask section that was looking for some experience and 
we took her on for post quarantine which you guys have very kindly shared for us a few times and she just needed some industry experience and she was very junior but she's been incredible I mean she like doubled our followers and everything just through her saying hey I'm looking for some industry experience um can I help out so yeah it's it's so like it yeah that it's my favorite bit it's just how lovely seniors are being but also just how everyone's just banding together to help make things happen in a really positive sense like I guess everything I've tried to sort of create is probably the antithesis of Twitter <laughs> like yeah. I just I just just I just can't bear the negativity as you can probably tell I just it's not in my mindset and so you know the whole the whole thing we've tried to build is positively helping everyone along their journey and I'm really bad I'll delete I shouldn't say anyway I, I'll delete <laughs> If people are nasty on the dots, I'll just delete them. <laughs> I'd be the worst person to, to run Twitter. I would have deleted Trump like years ago. It have totally gone. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's not, it's, it's everything, everything I've tried to build is like, you know, helping democratise our industry and make it accessible to everyone. And anyone who's got a good idea, or anyone who's got ambition can actually realise their full potential. And I guess that's kind of the magic bit that is lovely to see in the article. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, and one thing I want to quick, quickly mention about the projects bit is all the industry leaders I've spoken to, when they're hiring, they say that when they look at CVs and portfolios, they want to know what was your involvement in that project. And it's not always clear when you're looking at someone's work, what they've done. And this is what's so good about the dots, as you can see, what people have done in different projects and they can get the credit for it as well and even I had a session with Lou Bones from Jelly like the agent for Jelly London and she she uses like the dots and and things like that so it is a really effective tool 100% so that's the advice I give to people now make sure you're putting your projects on there and you're tagging yourself in projects that are on there especially in these times where people are looking for work and um, so um, so another thing about, so you were named by the Sunday Times as a top disruptive entrepreneur. What makes a disruptive entrepreneur, do you think? Oh, God, yeah. Oh, um, I think it's just thinking differently. I think, yeah, and thinking deeply about thinking differently. It's so funny because I, you know, I, you know, we internally were always like, you know, we're going to, the, our aim is to kind of become the biggest professional networking site. But I think what I spend a lot of my time thinking about is how do we actually enrich our community's lives? And I, I, what I get sort of frustrated about with something like LinkedIn, and LinkedIn really is the only professional network site that really exists right now, is that, you know, it's, it's geared around not outcome. It's geared around just trying to get you to look at the news feed and hang out and just, it's, and so everything I obsess about is building a solution that I guess is built more for the future workforce. So, you know, virtual events, um, the asks instead of a news, like with, you know, where you're actually getting help for something you specifically need help from. I don't want people to be on the dots all the time, like Facebook or Insta, like what a waste of time just hunting likes. Do you know what I mean? That's not what I want to create. I want to create a place where, as soon as someone needs help with their professional lives, they can get it. And that's, I guess, maybe that's why we're disruptive because we're just trying to reimagine professional networking that is actually about advancing your professional life, not just about kind of getting the ego boost that you might get on LinkedIn because you get a like or you get another connection. That's everything I'm trying to do is make ideas happen and make people love their careers and not have to be on us all the time. <laughs> Yeah, that's really interesting because it's like the complete opposite of how these other platforms are geared up, which is just about sucking you in and keeping you there scrolling and things like that. So, yeah, I want first people to scroll but find something that benefits them. And then once they've done that, they can get on and like have a wonderful career. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the more we think about it. Um, and so, how do you use the dots to promote like social responsibility because i know you're like big advocate of that but what are the main things that you do so a couple of things i mean we have an in-house curation team that go through the site um so 
what really bothers me about tech is algorithm bias that exists. So what I mean by that is, you know, places like Twitter or Instagram, the algorithms are very biased. And so, you know, you get a lot of hate speech on Twitter because that's what causes debate and gets people engaged with the platform. And so everything we try and do is sort of, I guess, thinking differently and doing it the opposite. And what we have is the reason we have a, invested so much in creation is is that helps sort of ideas and brilliant things come to the surface which an algorithm would never pick up mm -hmm. so the creation team everything we feature is has is projects for social purpose because you know we have this amazing powerful thing where we we can come up with ideas and there's so many problems going on in the world right now like if we pull our collective brains we can solve it all and so i guess everything i'm trying to inspire my community to do is is use their creativity for good and so that comes in from the project perspective and the things we choose to feature and the events we choose to feature um, and then from a, a individual who we feature again we go through all the profiles that um, update on or, or join the dots so that they don't get stuck at the bottom of search results and we have a curation rule that over 50% of um, people we feature always have to be female over 30% always have to be BAME and what the power of that you know, from an algorithm perspective is that then the networks they build will come higher in, in search results and it's it's funny because it's you know our community and i love men for any man that's listening on the call <laughs> but um yeah our community is now 68 percent female uh 31 percent bane 16 percent lgbt but we also do a lot of work helping support socioeconomic movement neurodiverse talent disabled talent and that's that's really driven by curation and also removing bad things that happen algorithms so for example on linkedin where you went to uni will boost you in an algorithm. So if you went to Oxford and you didn't go to uni, you're gonna get higher in search results because you went to Oxford. We've completely removed educational background in our search score completely because you should be judged on what you create, not your, not your educational background. And, mm -hmm. and so yeah, it's always thinking about our algorithm and how we can actually skew it for positivity, not for negativity, I guess. Yeah, that's fascinating because I know you have your curate section, but I didn't. I know that you've got a team. Your team are lovely. If ever I've spoken to them, they're super, super helpful. Um, but that's what you're doing is trying to actually boost certain individuals up that might get lost in the algorithms. Um, so individuals and projects with heart. So when all of that then feeds feeds in into the algorithm and the communities they build. So any individual we feature on the dots, the communities they start building, it has a knock on effect to them. So that just helps it become a more diverse, positive, and I guess, you know, inclusive platform. Yeah, and that's so, is that something you've always personally felt that you want to be a driving force behind with the dots? Yeah, I mean, my dyslexia was sort of such a sort of seminal moment, I guess, in my, my life, I, you know, I, I really struggled and I was, I was a very lucky one. So um, just to put into context, I mean, I, I, you know, it was the eighties when my dyslexia was diagnosed, which is really, no one knew about dyslexia there. And it was only because my mum actually was working for a charity um, uh, called the Kids on the Block, where she used to do educational puppet shows on disabilities. And so she used to go into primary schools and do these uh, um, puppet shows about teaching kids that, um, and she specifically looked after cerebral palsy, that someone with cerebral palsy, it may be a physical challenge, but they're just like you. And it was while she was working at this charity, she heard about this thing called dyslexia. And I think I always reflect that, you know, for every one of me, there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands we left behind who didn't reach their full potential. And what a, we've squandered so much amazing talent through people not being supported and not allowing, I guess, having a democratic industry. And also there are just things in my career where, you know, for example, when I was working for the government, I was working for David Blunkett, who's the Labour politician who is blind. And um, I, I learned this amazing lesson that David was brilliant because he was blind, not be despite of it. So he was just, he had no bias. So. He, whenever he had decisions, he made them fully just out of, with no bias of the world. And, and all these lessons along the way, and while I was working at MTV as well, 
everyone was just hiring mates and mates. And like, we ended up with this really homogenous workforce where everyone had similar backgrounds. We just didn't have this fresh and, you know, and if we wanted to build products for everyone, we need teams that reflect everyone. And so I guess all of that, it just frustrated me. And I'm one of these people that if something frustrates me, I just want to build a solution to counteract it. And, uh, and LinkedIn does the opposite. It's so biased at everything. I was like, I just, yeah, I want to make sure that anyone who has potential can realize that potential. Um, because I was, had a privilege to be able to do because I got diagnosed quite young. Sorry, I just went on and on. I'm finding something so similar with what I, I'm the same. Like if I find a problem for my own like dyslexia and struggles I've had to overcome, I'm always thinking of solutions, even when I speak to like the team I work with. And they're like, you need to focus sometimes. But there's all these things that I think about all the time from people that might be disadvantaged and how can I help and what support systems can we put in place? It's like one day I'll get to that thing and then that thing and then that thing. Um, but no, that's so interesting. It's um, funny, um, that's a key trait of dyslexia as well. They say I'm dyslexic and more empathetic. So we, hire, we, I don't know if you know this, but apparently it might be because when we were young, we were, we were always the outsider, so we empathize with anyone else. Um, so it's, it's, in, so it's basically, we over-index on empathy, um, which I'm, again, I'm never gonna take away my dyslexia. <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't change it either, I really wouldn't. And this is, um, I love the fact that with education, it's something that you don't put an emphasis on, because when I speak to agencies all the time about hiring talent, it's all about the portfolio. It's all about the work and the project. And, People might be interested if someone's at junior level where they study, but that's not the key decision making thing. You know, when they're actually taking someone on, it's all about the work and the craft and the ideas and the creativity and and not where they've been, but where they could go, where they look like they're going. And that's especially the creative industry. Yeah. Yeah. And in the end, like different experiences is what makes creative thinking unique. So like, you know, if we're all from from the same blooming universities it's just gonna just be awful output because like that's where the magic comes together is different ideas and different experiences and so yeah no it's uh it's definitely i think it you know it's definitely a strength uh, our differences are our strengths when it comes to creativity definitely yeah and so most like creatives are dyslexic anyway aren't they so uh and one thing I like Cindy Gallup says for people with disabilities, they learn how to life hack at police, <laughs> which is super useful. But um, I've just got a few more quick questions for you, Pip, and then we'll go on to the Q&A. So if anyone's got anything they'd like to ask, feel free to have a think about it now. Um, so how do you predict like the post lockdown world is going to look? Yeah, I mean, it's just accelerated the future, really. I mean, I, you know, we've kind of moved into 2025 before 2025 was here. Um, what I'm, and I'm always focusing on the positives, not the negatives, but what I'm really excited about is I think flexible working is here to stay and remote working. Um, and I think that is wonderful um, for families. And I think that's wonderful for mums and dads. And I think that's wonderful for anyone who doesn't now live in London. It will make the industry a lot more accessible. You know, some, like Twitter now, they've said they're remote first. So if you want to work at Twitter, you can work remote forever. You don't have to go back to the office. They will have an office if you want it. So I get really excited about that because I think that makes it accessible to everyone. You no longer have to have the privilege of living in London. Um, and you know, I, I I hope it remains. But this 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 spirit of supporting each other, I really I really hope that that sustains. Um, I think you know people have gone from thinking about I to we, and that is just going to make a much more collaborative and kinder environment. Um, I think the Black Lives Movement has been so important to actually reset companies as well and I I think anything anyone can do to support and keep making sure that this doesn't fall off the agenda is so important companies have to relook at everything they're doing internally and I really want that to stay 
and from an environmental standpoint you know i live on a, i live on the boat and we've got the canal there there's like fish they're like this big i've never seen fish in the canal so i'm desperate i'm desperate for us to rethink um the world we live around you know we've 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 got this beautiful chance to kind of reset and think about our consumer habits and think about you know what we what we're all all doing individually for the environment now so yeah mm-hmm. but then again i'm an optimist in it you know but that's that's what i hope is the future <laughs> Well, it's it's been so surreal because the pause button's been pressed and beforehand everyone was just working away and in the back of their minds people might be thinking of a different career path they wanted but they're like, I've got bills to pay, I need to go to work, I need to do this and that and the pause button has been pressed now and you've fallen into your life and it might be that as they say we're in the same storm but different boats you, it may have been paused with someone you're happy to be paused with or you're not um and we've had to make do with our situations and for some people it's been much easier than others um but with this chance to actually have a good think about our lives and where we want to go after this it's been quite like spiritual in a way for a lot of people i think mm-hmm. purpose purpose is what i keep hearing all the time pip that people are saying about how they're going to live their lives after this when they get it back again i'm so excited when i see like you know people have had that idea for a business and they've gone well sod it this is the best time to do it or you know and it's just yeah there's going to be such a a reset i think some companies are going to really struggle getting talent back in once things kick off again because yeah i mean we have one life you know we we you can live more frugally um and why don't we just try and be happy with our lives and our careers and so i hope that 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 will that will probably reset for for, for forever i guess (laughs) And I'm predicting because my whole strapline is creative recruitment with conscience and I only work with agencies I want to work with. And when I find a creative at home, it makes my life easier if they're really happy and they flourish and they stay for a long time, etc. So that's all I focus on. Mm-hmm. And I think you're right that certain companies that aren't aligning with people's ethics, they're going to really struggle to hire talent because I think we've got a different type of people at the moment with our whole mindset and and stuff it's going to be tough because right now a lot of people are out of work and they're probably going to be grabbing what they can for now i would imagine but with the view for a whole different um work culture environment and yeah the companies that they work for to have a bit more of a heart to what they do i think and i think it's been a reset for companies as well so i like to think that the most ethical and forward thinking companies are the ones that are going to survive and sadly there's going to be a lot of businesses that go under but i you know i think that it will be a reset for businesses as well um you know you can't thrive in this age without being empathetic and building inclusive teams and being more flexible it's just not going to work so but yeah again i'm an optimist i'm always the glass is half full <laughs> yeah, it's the best way to be um, <laughs> So, right, let's jump into some of these questions. So, okay. Um, so someone's asked, said that they've been out of work for over a year and would love some honest, brutal CV advice. How do I go about finding these mentors on the dots? Ah, easy, really easy. So go to um, our ask sec- section. So if you go to the dots and then go to kind of explore and then go to asks, and then literally you ask a question going, I would exactly what the way you termed it just then was absolutely perfect, by the way. Um, just say, I'm looking for some brutal, honest feedback. Um, put that up. And then when you post it, the key to it is tagging the relevant profession. So for example, if you're trying to get it in front of um, a creative directors, tag creative directors. If you're in engineering, for example, and you're trying to get it in front of CTOs, then Uh, tag CTOs and then what that does is that will then feed out to relevant people across the platform Um, and when I do the mentor um, email that goes out to all our mentors we always have a link to the where all the CV requests are and portfolio requests and people are just so so generous with their time so yeah super easy to do and the way you asked it was absolutely perfect And um, the next question is, you touched on this at the start, but any tips on how to combat the negative thoughts you may get when starting a business on failing, not getting any work and comparing yourself to others? 
So yeah, I, 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 <laughs> to maintain my mental health, I just stopped comparing myself to others. I actually don't even look at competitor sites. I just can't because it just fogs my brain and the vision for where I want to take the dots. So weirdly, I mean, obviously my team look at competitors, but um, so weirdly I, I do that. Um, I think a big part of every time I've gone through something really awful, and there's been lots of, I mean, starting a business is literally highs and lows that's it's a roller coaster ride and i think um the key is perseverance um i've learned like actually probably the most important skill a founder has is persevering through the hard times but also learning from the hard times and so i changed my mentality when some when i made a massive mistake or i did something wrong i used to beat myself up but now what i always do is sit down and go okay how do I never do that again? And I've actually got like a, um, a post-it note on my, um, on my computer, which literally has all, all my fuck ups, all my mistakes. And just so I remember not to repeat them, I'll always make new mistakes. But as soon as I change my mentality from uh, beating myself up to going, actually, what can I learn from this? That helped me develop moving forward. Um, and I think the other really important thing is mentors. So. I have like a big portfolio of mentors um, for loads of different disciplines. And that's kind of really helped having met. You should never take what mentors say as gospel. You know best about your business, but mentors are great for kind of chatting things through and giving you a new perspective on things. So yeah, mentors are wonderful. And there's so many great mental organizations for startups actually just drop me a note on the dots i always get back to every message so i'll send you links to this like kind of startup mental networks that exist well that would be really really useful um so any tips on how to connect and collaborate successfully on the dots yeah i think the most genuine connections made are through the ask forum and that's because it's also topic based so you'll find people that are chatting about things that are of interest to you so I would let definitely the kind of closest relationships of people that they don't know are made through asks. So, you know, there's loads of collaborator call outs that happen on the ask sections and they can be really like beautiful pro-social projects. So if you're passionate about Back Lives Matter, if you're passionate about the environment, you'll find people who are trying to get collaborators for those projects. So that's a really lovely way to make meaningful connections. But I think it's really important when you're on the dots also to connect with the people you know, because that will help recommend other good people to connect with as well. So um, those are the kind of two tips, I guess. <laughs> and um, is it better to have a tiny portfolio or wait until you have more projects to showcase on the dots? So we do, in pre-coronavirus, we used to do these portfolio masterclasses, where, um, which were uh, live events with companies where they'd review portfolios. Hopefully we get to start them up again soon. But um, the one thing someone once said to me is like the average quality of your portfolio is brought down by the worst project in it. Yeah. So for me, I've always been less is more. Um, don't just, it's, yeah, don't just put loads of projects. But Nikki, you know this as well. What's your advice? Yeah, I, I do agree with you there that it's better to have only have work that you're proud of because all these industry leaders discussions um, and they're on YouTube as well, guys, if anyone wants to look back on those. And, but a lot of them say don't ever put anything in there that you're not proud of just to make your portfolio look like it's got more projects because they'll point it out uh the interviewer will and then if people say mm, no i'm not too proud of that like, just don't have it in there so it's all about like quality over quantity every time and start showing off some of your work because even if you've just got one or two projects but they're amazing it's better having them on there than being shy thinking you don't have enough also, creatives obsess over the amount of pages and the amount of projects they should have. So I've interviewed now people from Design Studio, Rosie Lee, um, Becky from VaynerMedia, and they've all said, um, don't worry about pages. Everyone needs to obsess over this number of pages you have to have a number of projects. It's not about that. Nobody cares. OK, it's just all about the work itself. Um, and actually, if you post it on the ask section as well, you'll get honest feedback from the community if you put it up as an ask. And I think the other interesting thing I saw in our masterclasses is if I went up to someone afterwards 
um, uh, one of the kind of, so we, it, the way it would work is you'd have like 10 mentors and then 30 people attending and it'd be a bit more like speed recruitment than a, a, a crit really. Um, but whenever I ask the mentors who stuck out, it's amazing how many um, always point to the person who's worked on a project with social heart. And I, it's, it's so fascinating because I think a lot of seniors are so um, frustrated with what's going on in the world and they want to make a difference. And so, yeah, just work on passion projects of problems you see in the world and that will actually stick in the mind of, of, of um, hirers as well. So, um. yeah, I've always been a big advocate for like side hustles and um, passion projects and it's always worth people having something of that and it's of interest to the person interviewing as well because they're not just wanting to know what's the commercial work you've had to produce that's the bread and butter that pays those agencies bills you know what do you want to do what excites you and and that's where the interest is um so next question is i'm super new to the uk and moved before covid hit i was freelancing for that in amsterdam i'm on the dots but a bit confused as to how i can reach people on it not sure how the algorithm works and how can i uh find creative recruiters or new clients would love some insight on that thanks a lot oh, so um in terms of creative recruiters if you go to people um, in the main navigation and literally you can put in recruiter, HR manager, talent manager, you'll get a list of all of the recruiters in, on the dots. So literally you can just connect with everyone. Um, so that's the best way to connect with them. But again, it, it's, it's the asks. I think, you know, it's all about genuine genuine connections these days. Um, you know, Nikki said that she, someone put up a thing saying, um, what, what was the ask that someone put up that you spotted? What did it say? Um, they didn't have any industry experience in that area, but they just wanted a bit of kind of social media management experience. So um, we had them work on like post quarantine. Yeah, amazing. And um, yeah, and she was absolutely incredible. So that's kind of a way to do it is you can do it that way or like a really good way is to look through the collaborations and see who's doing call outs for collaborations because you'll start building a network of people in the UK that you're collaborating with and a lot of stuff still happens word of mouth these days and I mean the hard reality is there just aren't there aren't that many jobs at the moment. I mean, there's a lot of tech jobs, but there are not so many elsewhere. So starting building up your network by collaborating with other people um, is a great way. So just go to asks and head to the collaboration list and just start engaging with people that way. I think would be nice. And a big bit of advice I'd give anyone is work on your profile. So make sure you've got all your projects there because if you just, if someone say added me and said, hey, Nikki, can you help? and I looked on their profile and there was nothing there. I don't know how I can help yeah. this individual and with all the will in the world of wanting to, it's the advice that I always give is, don't make someone work to find you work, make it easy, have all your projects there, all the information, and then instantly they can think, oh, so-and-so would be great there or great there. But if they don't have that as a starting point, it's really hard for people to know how they can help you out in the first place. 100%. Nikki, I need to like take you everywhere we need to talk. Next question is, if remote working sticks around and we don't live in London, do you think we'll be penalised for never having experience of working in London agency businesses in the past on our CVs? Um... Uh, again, I'm an optimist and it's probably too early to tell, but I would like to say no. And I like to say that a lot of the bigger agencies will be because they'll start thinking about remote working more, will be more, you'd still be able to get a big, big agency um, on your CV, even if you were remote. Um, that might be semi-optimistic, but I, um, I think the other really interesting thing is maybe not always think about agencies as well. Um, you know, there are so many amazing opportunities outside of kind of Adland now. Um, and Adland's really struggling, um, really struggling. And they probably will struggle for a long time. Um, so do think about potentially looking at, you know, 
tech is so strong right now like it's insane you know a lot of the opportunities are in tech and a lot of tech companies actually have creative agencies in-house you know you've got facebook's got facebook shop and google's got oh my gosh what's it called google creative labs and i think maybe I think maybe and now is the time to kind of think more laterally about the companies you work for because my feeling when we look at and talking to companies and the industry as a whole, I think Adlan's going to be in a lot of trouble, but it doesn't mean you can't have a wonderful creative career. You just might have to think slightly laterally about where you do it. And there'll be a lot more remote opportunities in tech because tech is definitely going to be remote first or most of tech will be remote first. I'd like to add on that, Pip. I'm really glad you said that. So anyone here that wants some like industry insight, Adland, um, lots of conversations I've had, there's going to be redundancies, unfortunately. Um, but I have received a couple of junior roles for a tech startup recently that I'm resourcing for. Um, I'm working jobs in Amsterdam because the UK is a bit quieter at the moment. And they're actually open to people working remotely. OK, so here's some positivity that's going on at the moment. Just look outside of almost like London and the UK and reach out to other agencies um and see what you can do there but yeah you're so right pip adlan's gonna go through a bit of um a tricky patch and needs to kind of come out the other side of that but tech is on the up at yeah. the moment and as you said the creative team's in there so that would be quite a, a smart move with people and do your research as well so um and find out what's going on and what I'm really excited about is tech has finally realized how valuable creative is. So you yeah. are seeing this whole like kind of trend. I think like four or five years ago, they were a little bit skeptical, but now they understand the value of beautiful UI and beautiful UX and they understand the value of brand thinking. And so it's sort of changing. Um, they, I mean, really interestingly with copywriting, like Google, who we work with, they're really obsessed with copywriters, but they're actually obsessed with copywriters who are, haven't trained as copywriters. They're obsessed with copywriters who write their own blog or their own magazine, who like, do copy more like a human. So I guess, so that doesn't mean if you're a copywriter, you don't do it like a human, but you know what I mean? Like less like an ad trained copywriter. So it's really interesting. I, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of opportunities in tech and, yeah, I mean, it's really, when we look at our stats on the dots, you know, there's very few graphic design roles, but there's loads of UI roles. So if there is, there, if there is an opportunity for you to reskill slightly, um, then, you know, thinking about the tech side of what you do is always a massive benefit. Yeah, definitely. So I'll wrap this up, Pip, because I know you've... Um we've got to get on but thank you so much for your time i really really appreciate it and all the advice that you've shared with us today and i hope you all found it useful and um, that joined us thanks for tuning in mm. and um yeah take care everyone oh, bless you thanks for having me <laughs> thank you for being a mentor on the dots you're a legend no, no worries <laughs> thanks for asking <laughs> uh, speak to you soon bye-bye